Great to be here. In our book, Sparks of Genius, Bob and I argue that a set of 13 thinking tools form the bases of creative imagination across the arts and sciences. These include capacities of thought and feeling that we may all be familiar with but don't think much about. Observing, for instance, abstracting, pattern recognizing, pattern forming, empathizing, modeling, and so forth. These thinking tools represent what creative individuals from across the arts and sciences, humanities, and technologies have to say about how they think through problems, imagine possible solutions, and fashion effective innovations. And yes, uh, this is taking a big C perspective, but I think the point is that because what they're doing for some of these people can be so explicit, we have access to what is going on in their minds as they, as they experience it, that it tells us much about little c or personal creativity, that there really is no distinction. So what this lived experience of imaginative and creative activity tells us is this. The thinking tools are universal. They're germane to a wide array of problem-solving activities. The tools are also largely intuitive, that is to say, based in personal experience. They are sensual, based in primary images of sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, bodily feeling, and emotion. And they are teachable, responsive to classroom exercise and practice. Hone these skills, uh, as many successful individuals would argue, and you hone the muscles of creative imagination and, in a sense, for everyone, <coughs> maximize um, the creative capital of society. Next slide, please. So bring up creative imagination, and most people immediately think of the arts, and with good reason. Indeed, many of the thinking tools are highly associated with artistic endeavor and artistic training. You can take a look here at tool use among one group of artists in the red bars, a group that reported high use over 50%, uh, used empathizing, body thinking, playing, abstracting, modeling, and the mental imaging of sight, sound, movement, etc., as thought experiment. But note, too, that these same tools are being used by scientists and engineers. The relative importance of any one thinking skill may differ from group to group, as indeed from individual to individual, but the same range of cognitive skills contribute to the work of art and science. So I want to take a brief look at some of these tools so you get a sense of what we're talking about here. Next slide, please. So observing is our first skill. Requires the honing of all senses in order to perceive acutely. As human beings, we are all equipped to sense the world, but observing is a skill that requires additional patience, concentration, and curiosity, some of the skills and, and things that we've been hearing about today. The visual artist Georgia O'Keeffe looked carefully at things, and she tells us something about that skill with regard to her very large paintings of flowers. Still, in a way, she said, nobody sees a flower really. It is so small. We haven't the time. And to see takes time, like to have a friend takes time. And she learned from a grade school teacher to pay attention to the small details of flowers, and her paintings ask us to do that as well. Next slide. Carl von Frisch, who won a Nobel Prize for his observations of communication among bees, also took the time to observe deeply. By waiting for hours, motionless, watching living things, he wrote, I discovered that miraculous worlds may reveal themselves to a patient observer where the casual passerby sees nothing at all. Next slide. So abstracting, our next slide, our next tool, refers to the process of discovering simplicity in the complexity of all that we observe by eliminating everything but one essential characteristic. Picasso provides an excellent example. All abstracting, he said, begins with something real and then proceeds by eliminating more and more elements. At the upper left, he begins with a fairly realistic bull and then going left to right, he explores which characteristics of the bull are most essential. Is it the mass or the planes, the outlines, the size of the horns, the tail, the sexual organs? In the end, at the lower right, he decides upon a simple set of lines that simply suggest bull. Next slide, please. The work of the Nobel Prize winning biologist Nico Tinbergen demonstrates that scientists use the same process of abstracting whenever they perform an experiment. 
In this instance, Tinbergen studied the behavior of the herring gull and noticed that the chicks pecked at the parent's beak to obtain food. So what was the stimulus? Was it the smell of food or perhaps that red dot that is uh, on the lower beak? Tinbergen made a simple, realistic cardboard model of a gull's head and presented it to the chick, and that's on the left there. And the chicks pecked at the beak, so he knew now that smell wasn't involved because there's no smell of food on that uh, cardboard model. So what was the trigger? Um, so he made other models. What happened if he changed the shape of the head, changed the color, left off the red dot? What if he moved the red dot somewhere else on the head or simply presented the chicks with something like a red pencil or a red ball? And he eventually discovered by eliminating what didn't work and what did, keeping what did, that all pecking for food could be elicited by anything that was red. So red was the ultimate abstraction for the signal food. Next slide, please. So empathizing, another important tool, means becoming one with the object of study in a zen-like integration of self and other in order to know a thing or process from the inside out. Actors exercise <coughs> empathy. Konstantin Stanislavski, shown here as himself and in one of his signature roles, said, quote, I only had to assume a character's manners and habits, even off the stage, and in my soul there were born the feelings and perceptions that had given them birth. Interestingly enough, the same intuitive grasp of the other works with non-human, even inanimate subjects of study. Next slide, please. The late physicist Jacob Shaham used empathizing to understand <coughs> physical equations and the processes they describe. Learning how to solve these equations is not enough, he believed. Equations are like the script of a play. You have to be able to imagine the stage upon which the equations play out their actions and how the various characters that their symbols represent will behave under various circumstances. He himself had learned the subtleties of this process during drama lessons, which had required acting out the single word, hi. Uttered loudly and accompanied by waving hands, hi means something totally different than when mumbled quietly, face turned away. Equations, too, have different meanings depending on context and interpretation. Empathizing, just as one does on the stage, can be scientifically useful. Next slide. Body thinking, another important tool, means using muscle memory, physical feelings, gut reactions, and emotional states to recognize, organize, and address problems. Body thinking was one of the foremost, uh, of foremost importance to Auguste Rodin's famous sculpture, The Thinker. He said of the thinker that, the, that he thinks not only with his mind, but with his knitted brow, his clenched fist, his gripping toes, and indeed his entire posture. Next slide. MIT-trained engineer Summer Gentry has used body thinking to try to engineer robots to dance with each other. As an avocational dancer, she recognized that it is one thing to make a robot that can mimic the individual motions of a human being, as in that center picture. But it is quite another to invent robots that can respond to physical signs and signals as human partners do and move in concert without stepping on each other's toes. Next slide. Discovering those signs and signals surely involved playing, yet another of our imaginative thinking tools. Play is all about doing something like dancing for the fun of it without direct purpose. Yet that same play can incidentally develop new skills and novel understanding. It can court serendipitous discovery. Sir Alexander Fleming was a great player who combined both art and science in his many games. One of those games involved painting. Next slide. Painting, but with a twist. As it says on this agar plate, this is not written with ink, but with bacteria that develop colors as they grow. And in yet another twist, Fleming's painting with bacteria just for fun next slide, resulted in one of the greatest medical discoveries of all time. While collecting colored microbes for his micro microbiological palate, he came across the bluish-green penicillium notatum, the mold that produces the drug penicillin. Not only did Fleming appreciate the mold's distinctive color, but because of his extensive experience with microbial interactions in his microbe paintings, he immediately recognized its pharmacological potential. Next slide. 
So I'd like to take a moment now to take a look at a special kind of complex play. I have a book coming out this spring on the invention of imaginary worlds, or what I call world play. Flourishing in childhood, usually between the ages of 6 and 12, world play is notable for its persistence. The play scenario does not disappear at the end of the day. It's also notable for its elaboration. Aspects of the play scenario evolve towards increasing complexity and with its association with artistic activities such as drawing, storytelling, writing, and other forms of cultural invention. Here we have some of the documents of world play generated by C.S. Lewis as a child, the invention of which he believed prepared him for his career as a writer. Next slide. To learn more about this play, I sampled two populations, MacArthur Fellows, who are selected for evident creative achievement. Those are in the black bars and Michigan State University students in the gray bars who are selected for average achievement. I found the incidence of childhood world play in the general population, that is to say the MSU students, to be about 12%. That's circled in blue. I also found that childhood world play may be an incubator for creative giftedness, for its incidence is about twice as high, 26% among fellows. Next slide. Moreover, many fellows and many students recognized elements of world play in their adult work. MacArthur's significantly more often than students in the humanities, social sciences, and sciences, though interestingly enough not in the arts, a sign that the arts are generally understood to be imaginative and exploratory. As creative practitioners, however, fellows recognized world play not only in the fictions of story and poem, or in other art forms, but in the reconstructions of history, in the alternative hypotheses and scenarios of social science, and in the experiments, models, and theories of science. Next slide. A bit farther afield from the MacArthur's, Bob and I asked individuals awarded startup grants by the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, MEDC. Those are in the gray bars. We also asked MSU engineers in the black bars whether they envisioned possible worlds as part of their work processes. The MEDC grantees who held multiple patents and had founded at least one company were significantly more likely to use world play as a creative strategy than MSU engineers, individuals who held fewer patents and did not found companies. Next slide, please. So the invention of imaginary worlds, both in childhood and adulthood, appears highly associated with creative practice and achievement. There are many factors that may contribute to this association. For one, I argue that building an analog world in make-believe engages multiple imaginative thinking tools, in particular observing, imaging, pattern recognizing and pattern forming, modeling, and of course, playing. Next slide. Thus far in our research, Bob and I have found that these imaginative tools correlate well with high disciplinary productivity, that, which is often associated with creative achievement and impact. Using a pool of 225 scientists and engineers, we looked at a number of papers compared to the use of thinking tools. Those individuals who used abstracting and modeling produced an, on average twice as many papers as those who did not use those imaginative skills a difference that proved statistically significant. Those who cited use of playing, analogizing, and imagination in general also tended on average to be doubly productive, suggesting a definite trend. Next slide, please. Given this close association and trend, Bob and I have argued that the imaginative thinking tools and world play too have a place in educating for creativity. Unfortunately, current pedagogical practice pays uneven heed to the nurture of imagination. In an unpublished study undertaken with colleagues and students at MSU, for instance, Bob and I tracked the exercise of the thinking tools in biology textbooks used in elementary and secondary classrooms. Overall, we found a handful of tools actively taught and practiced, another handful presented without practice, and uh, the remaining few were absent or even proscribed. And I should say that we also found a kind of developmental progression here. In the younger grades, more of the tools were used, and as we proceeded through middle school into high school, they dropped out dramatically. Next 
slide, please. So here's a graph of data that Bob and I gathered on imaginative skills among one pool of career scientists and engineers, similar to that graph I presented at the start of my presentation. There you can see the use of observing, abstracting, body thinking, and so forth. Next slide. So the same data is represented here in the red bars. And the blue bars tally explicit or actively presented thinking tools in biology textbooks at the high school and college level. Except for a fair amount of observing and modeling and a bit of abstracting and analogizing, science education in the upper grades severely curtails the exercise of imaginative skills necessary to scientific work. Scientific practice to the contrary. And this is just at the time that students are gaining enough knowledge to access creative practice in science. And that's when the imaginative engagement drops out. So there's kind of a problem there. So I know I'm running out of time, and I'd like just to point out that a growing literature demonstrates that the arts can provide excellent training in these tools, training the transfers from the arts to other disciplines. For, in for instance, uh, visual imaging ability, which you can see from this graph, is highly germane to scientific practice, can be pedagogically enhanced in science class by artistic drawing instruction. For this reason, among others, the arts, like mathematics or reading, have a utility central to the core curriculum, which I would argue centers around development or exercise of that language of personal imaginative thinking. What I'd like to conclude now is simply this. Starting in childhood, the exercise of imaginative thinking tools, whether informally or formally, through art or through play, can incubate the kind of creative potential that flowers in adult work. And in fact, the tools give us a handle on the kind of cognitive activity that carves out that creative space that many of us have been talking about today. We can also begin to address the lack of imaginative training in the sciences and other fields too by integrating the arts as they exercise the thinking tools into the core curricula, curricula and perhaps do that using the invention of imaginary worlds and other forms of complex play to scaffold and generate a creativity space. Thank you. <laughs>